with the microphone before. Could you say your name and your organization? Is it okay? Hello, so. nice to meet you. I'm from Hong Kong TV News Channel. I'm Cecilia Kwok, Kwok Wing Si. Nice to meet you on San Shu Ti. Uh, actually, you have been fighting for democracy and freedom of people uh, for many years. Uh, what are your advice to Hong Kong people for those who are striving for democracy in Hong Kong? And secondly, uh, do you think that uh, Hong Kong people are losing their freedom and democracy under the one country, two system policy? Thank you. I think if you, people really want freedom and democracy, they get it. I've always believed that people always get what they really want. The mind you, when they find it, it might not be quite what they expected. But uh, we have to believe in what we are doing if we are to succeed. So the first requirement is that the people should, of Hong Kong should know what they really want and believe in it. If they believe in it, they'll get it. It's, it's very simple. But of course, that means a lot of hard work. No. Hello, I'm Amrita Chima, Deutsche Welle Television from Germany. Great to see you looking so well after one year's uh, coming into, out, into, uh, out of your isolation. My question is, you said that you want to stand for president in the next elections, but the constitution needs to be amended. What steps are required to amend the constitution? How hopeful are you that it will be done? Well, I'm told that this is the most difficult constitution in the world to amend. First of all, uh, it has to be the, any, uh, it's not all the points in the Constitution, but the major ones, if you want to change them, more, more than 75% of uh, the members of both legislatures have to vote for it. And that's not the end of the story. And then it has to be put to a referendum, and uh, it has to be approved by more than 50% of those who are on the... Um, those who are eligible to vote. So that's a very difficult process. Don't forget that 25% of the members of, of both legislatures are military appointees, unelected military appointees. So in order to get more than 75%, first of all, all the civilian seats will have to be filled and all the civilian uh, representatives would have to agree that they want to amend the constitution. And then, as I keep saying, at least one brave soldier must say, I, I will side with the civilian representative. So it's very, very difficult, but it's not impossible. And I've, um, I think it was in an RAF outfit somewhere I heard that during the Second World War, they had a motto, which was, we do the impossible every day, miracles take a little longer. The question's right there first, and then we can. Judge Dane from Voice of America. Permit service and Didi Mawa. Thank you. Last year in Bangkok at 2012 World Economic Forum, you talked about youth unemployment in Burma. You said that it was like a time bomb. And uh, your main message was, I believe, to the foreign investors coming to Burma was to create jobs. What is your main message to the foreign investors this year in this place? Thank you. It's the same thing because this issue has not been addressed adequately. Everywhere I go in this country, there are six requirements that people keep repeating to me. It's amazing how it's the same everywhere. I get the same message everywhere. When I go to the villages, whether it's in the south of Burma or north, south, east, west, I always try to ask, I ask them. Uh, I try to speak as, to as many of the, uh, of the people in the towns and villages as possible, and I ask them, what they need most. And always the answer is, first of all, jobs. They want work. They don't want handouts. They want the dignity of being able to work for their own living, to earn their own living. Number one is jobs. Number two, water. Number three, roads. Number four, uh, electricity. Number five, education. Number six, health. It's, this is repeated everywhere, everywhere. And so jobs are a priority and especially jobs for our youth. In my uh, constitution, constituency, 75% of our graduates are unemployed. And I have been told by independent surveyors that this is very much the national average for youth unemployment. About 70% of our youth are unemployed. And as I keep saying, it's not joblessness 
that is so worrying as much as hopelessness. When they get to a point when they lose hope in the future, then these young unemployed people will be a social problem for us. Uh, Da Martin Sung from CNBC over here. Uh, The question is, just in front of you, the question is related, and that is right now there seems to be almost like a gold rush. A lot of foreign companies want to come in, win contracts, win tenders, do business, do trade, etc., which is good in a way. Myanmar needs the money. But what parts of this frenzy worry you? Actually, there isn't that much investment coming in. I think it's more investigations than investment. People are coming here to investigate the possibility of investing here. But yes, it is a frenzy, and the, a frenzy is never attractive. I keep saying cautious optimism, and some think that I'm a wet blanket because I talk about cautious optimism. But I think that's just practical. And I think those who come here and look, they're always the same problems. First of all, they worry about rule of law, and that's one of my main concerns. Uh, because it's not just because I'm the chair of the Rule of Law and Tr- Tranquility Committee, because I believe that without rule of law, we can't get anywhere. We can't get economic development either, because that's what the serious businesses are looking for, rule of law. How safe are the investments going to be? That's one thing. And the other is infrastructure, which goes back to what our villagers tell us, roads, electricity. So this is why investments are not pouring in, just investigations are pouring in. And let's stop the frenzy a bit. We're going to go to the back there first. You have to... Hello, this is Adit from the Associated Press. Um, if uh, we weren't content enough with your answer before this morning, uh, so I need to ask you again. Um, if you succeed in, in amending the Constitution, and if you become the president of Myanmar, uh, what will you do for the ethnic minorities and in, uh, with special regard to the Rohingya people and, and the Muslim, uh, the people who believe in, in Islam in this country? Thank you. First of all, as I said, I believe in the rule of law. And everybody in this country should be entitled to the protection of the law. Everybody, all ethnic groups, all religious groups. But with regard to the ethnic nationalities, that is to say those who are now in the states, we'll have to go for a federal system. This has always been the policy of our party, that we need federalism to keep our union intact. For decades, actually, the propaganda of the authoritarian governments had been that Uh, federalism equals right to secession. And we've always had to explain that federalism does not mean secession, that in fact federalism is a way of preventing secession because it's a way of removing the grievances that lead people to call for secession. We are very weak in negotiated compromise in this country. It's partly to do with our culture and partly to do with the fact that we have lived under authoritarian rule for so long that uh, negotiation is practically unknown. And if you don't, if you're not used to negotiation, then you don't get to a negotiated compromise. And we have to go in for that. We have to find the answers to our problems together. And what I would like to, to ask the world to do is to help us to find the solutions to our own problems in our own way always upholding international standards of human rights. We go to the front row and we come to the back there. Dorsu, um, you uh, paint quite a bleak picture when you go into the uh, percentages of unemployed youth and uh, this and that and the terrible lack of electricity and roads. You also recently said, I think, in Yangon, or, uh, some quite negative things about the pace of reform uh, the, under this government and said that you know, the reforms hadn't been uh, made as big an impact as they could. Do you, uh, do you st- feel the government uh, hasn't lived up to promises and could do more or do you feel that... Uh, uh, it could I do mean, more. What I've said is that I think uh, we've uh, concentrated enough on good intentions. Now what we want to look at are results. And the results are not as fantastic as you might expect them to be. Because don't forget that we're in the third year 
of the so-called reform process. And I keep repeating this. Three years is not a short period. I think uh, you, you can't keep saying, well, you know, it's, it's not been long yet, it's not been long yet. I mean, how long is long? And three years is a long time for somebody who can't get three me square meals a day. And so we want results now. It, and it's the lives of the ordinary people which have not changed. Uh, if, you go, if you ask the average, uh, average citizen in, in this country what has changed, they will talk about the fact that there's greater freedom of the media because there is a, a proliferation of news magazines and journals. And then there are those who will say that there are, there are more cars in the streets of Rangoon than ever before. But these are not accessible to the great majority of our people who, who uh, constitute about 60 to 70 percent. So we want change in the lives of those people, those who live in the rural area, and also, of course, in the lives of our urban poor. So this is what I mean by saying that reform has not brought the kind of changes that our people want. And how long will they go on waiting for it? We don't want them to lose faith in the reform process. My name is Christiana with the German Press Agency. My question goes in the same direction. What concretely would you say should the government do or have done to get those changes to the p rural people? Or to put it in another way, what would you do as president now to make sure that these people see the benefits of economic opening? Well, let me tell you just what I've been doing simply as an MP in my constituency. Now, as I said earlier, Jobs, water, roads, um, electricity, education, health. That's what they always talk about. And the most difficult thing of all is the first one, jobs. Job creation. This is why when I talk to business people, I always try to encourage uh, them to uh, do, engage in the kind of investment that will create jobs. As, as you all know, the extractive industries do not uh, create too many jobs. They are not strong on jobs, but Burma is strong on extractive industries. So we have this problem to deal with. I can't uh, create as many jobs as I want in my constituency. So I go for what I can do. The first thing I went for was water, because that was the easiest, and yet this was a great need. And uh, as soon as I became, uh, I was elected, I started uh, arranging for wells to be dug. It's as simple as all that. And yet, Burma is supposed to be the country in Southeast Asia with the, with, uh, the greatest res water resources, and we don't have enough water. And then I went about roads, because this was, again, a possibility. So what I would like the government to do is, first of all, to target the greatest needs of our people, our country, and then see what can be done first, and then go about it. I've often made the complaint that there's no structure to the reform process. We are not aware of a government policy with regard to the reform process, how they're going to go about it, what their priorities are, and what the sequencing is going to be. So that is what I would like to see. Priorities, sequencing, targeted, targeting the most uh, urgent needs of the country. A uh, question from the Straits Times of Singapore. Um, this morning, uh, uh, um, you spoke about the presidency and your interest in it, uh, and just now you said it takes one brave soldier to uh, help turn the tide. Oh, I think we'd, need, we'd actually like more than one. Okay. Uh, I think 300,000 wouldn't be bad. Right. Have you got any indication from the military? Uh, there, were, there was a former Navy chief referring to you as uh, elder sister at that uh, event. Well, uh, don't forget, got, he's a retired uh, never mind. Um, <laughs> military officer. Have you got officer. any indication from the military that uh, they may uh, not be averse to having you as president? No, I've had no direct indication of any kind like that from the military. But I do believe that members of the military are as keen as civilians to promote development and growth in our country because they know our country is poor. And don't forget that the majority of our soldiers are not wealthy either. Um, 
just to go back to your uh, you points you about... Your oh, sorry. Yeah. My name is Simon Rockneen. I file for the Irrawaddy and a couple of others. Um, to go back to your point about, um, about uh, job creation and similar needs, um, what legislation is being planned and is being uh, debated in Parliament these days uh, with that regard? I, I know there's a minimum wage law. Is there anything else? And, and what's the well, timeline for Well, of course, it was the FDI. And uh, we do expect foreign investment to create jobs. And uh, they are now working on um, a law to promote uh, uh, the interests of farmers and peasants. And this is to create a rural work. And uh, I suppose you do know already about the minimum wage law. We are trying to investigate the possibilities of what we can do as a legislature. But, but uh, it's not all just about laws. It's also about making sure that these laws are observed and uh, implemented, which, is, which goes back to rule of law. And what I personally want to do in the legislature is to make sure that the judiciary becomes independent and clean. Uh, thank, thank you, Andy. I am I'm from Skynet. Andy, please write. That's me. You're right. You're right. right. Oh, right, Connor, right. Uh, okay. Yes, oh, thank okay. you. Uh, we all know that uh, you, you are very emphasizing you also the poor party reduction. And the question is that we would like, we would like to know the, your ideas of the poor party reduction or Myanmar. Thank you. Uh, reducing poverty in Myanmar means yes. reducing the poverty of the people in our rural areas. Because as I think, uh, I'm sure this statistic has been drummed into your head every, every half an hour since yesterday, so nearly 70% 70, 70 of our population live in the rural area. So uh, Burma is basically an agriculture country. And because of that, if we want to reduce poverty, we have to look to our rural population. So it's our agricultural policy. And that starts with land. I think uh, you must have heard about the issue of landlessness in this country and the problem of illegal transfers of land. So this is a, a legal issue. And there's a committee in the legislature which is looking into the problem of the illegal transfer of land and what we can do to have it transferred back to the rightful owners. This is a very, very complicated business because uh, keeping, um, keep, keeping official papers is also not part of our tradition. So it is very difficult sometimes to establish ownership, apart from the fact that we have to sort out how the land was illegally transferred and what it can be done to transfer it back to the original owners. Quite often, we have a problem identifying who the, uh, the original owners are. So I think we have to start with things like land laws, but not, again, it's not just the laws. It's the, it's the implement, um, implementation of the laws that we have to be concerned about. And if we cannot bring our agriculture population out of poverty, we are going to remain a poor country because that, it means that 70% of our people will remain poor. Go to Thomas and then we go to Beuda. Okay. Hi, Dasu. Uh, Thomas Fuller from the New York Times. Uh, you've said many times that you uh, do not want to take sides in the Rakhine conflict. Um, but the ledger, the ledger of casualties and deaths has been overwhelmingly on the Muslim side. It's a one-sided ledger, really. Um, I, I, I don't say this critically. I, I'm hoping to get an insight into your political calculation, your political situation now. Do you feel like you're in a straitjacket politically? I mean, you're, you're someone who's always spoken out at, for the downtrodden, for you know, the, the, the victims. And here we've seen you uh, be reserved. Uh, do you feel like you're a, a hostage to the political circumstance of the day? No, I um, don't feel a hostage to the political circumstances of the day. What I am afraid of is aggravating the situation. Uh, I do not want to aggravate the situation by saying that one community is wrong or the other community is wrong. And what it does is to aggravate the more extremist elements in these communities. If they feel that they have been targeted, if they feel that they do not enjoy the, the sympathy of politicians or, 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 or um, influential groups, then 
it makes them more extremists. That is what I'm afraid of, that instead of helping the situation, we will aggravate it further. So what I want to target, uh, I want to target actions rather than communities, which means accountability. I want, that again, that goes back to rule of law. Uh, the government must make sure that those who have committed crimes are punished in accordance with the law. There must be accountability. But I do not want fingers pointed at particular communities because it always aggravates the other side. And uh, this seems to have started a vicious cycle of people getting more and more aggressive and more and more extremists. That's what I'm afraid of. Oh, at the back there. Yeah. Hello, my name is... Uh, sorry, you can't see me. I'm here. The lights. No, uh, my name is Bill Hayton. I'm training journalists at MRTV at the moment. Uh, this evening, I hope that state television might broadcast you talking about politics for the first time ever. But at the moment, they're, talking, they're going to take a soundbite of you speaking in English with a Burmese voiceover. Uh, they're a bit shy to ask the question themselves. Could you say the same thing again in Burmese, explaining that you wish to stand for the presidency and the obstacles that stand in your path, but in Burmese... I'm Burmese getting a little do. bit tired of this presidency business. And I think the reason why people are so interested is uh, that given to me by the BBC interviewer who said that he'd, he'd never come across an, in any politician who admitted to wanting office. So, and that whenever she asked him, do you want to become the president or the prime minister, the answer usually was something like, as well, if the people really want me to, and so on and so on. So I said to her, and do you believe them when they say this? And she said, no, I don't believe them. So I said, I might just really as well be honest and say, yes, I do aspire to the presidency, as I should, as a leader of a political party uh, that is going to take part in the electoral process. Uh, the whole thing. <laughs> All right. Tomorrow, the case of Jamkan Khami Bari, the matter of which channel, no, the BBC, 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 the ไอ้ดีแต่งงานก้าวซ้อนเนี่ยผิดๆจูซ่าดิสระดาตบาวะจ่าดิสระตัวจมาก็ပြောเลยตูบ่มีบุมาเหมียนบุเดไหนไงต
Yeah, well, I've been talking about land reform. I was talking about it just now when I said that one of our big problems is landlessness, land ownership. Yes, this is necessary in our country because too many of our farmers have uh, plots of land which are far too small. And on top of that, too many of them are beginning to lose their land now, some through debt and some through illegal transfer or takeover of land. So these are legal matters that have to be looked into. And I said, as I said earlier, laws are not enough. We have to have free, independent judiciaries which will make sure that these laws are observed. Uh, and in, uh, my, my name is Tanhai from the GG Press. Uh, I'd, like to <clears throat> I'd like to ask about the Rakhine conflicts where some people are saying that there are, uh, this conflict is staged by some people inside the government who wants to turn back the, this current reform process. And hardliners are doing this because some people <clears throat> said that the problem started from a news report from the state media about a rape case, which they published the... About it? And this, conf this conflict started... This conflict started because of a report in the state newspaper of a rape case. They published the religion and ethnic city in the rape case, which is not normal in the news media. So some people speculate that it is staged by some people inside the government, and I'd like to ask your opinion about that. Yes, I've heard these speculations, there are many of them, but uh, I, as a believer in rule of law and justice, I would deem that everybody is innocent until proven guilty beyond a, a shadow of a doubt, and speculations are not enough uh, to use as accusations. There are always speculations when these kind of incidents emerge, but I do not think that we should go around accusing people of uh, conspiracies because this could be very destabilizing for our country, which is not to say that conspiracies do not exist. Sometimes conspiracies do exist, and uh, people talk about them, people speculate. I think all we have, what we need is more transparency, more uh, interaction, more engagement between different communities, between the government and the people, between the media and the government, uh, local government, as well as central government, so that we are more and more aware of what is going on. And the, the more we know about the actual situation, the more transparency there is, the fewer speculations there will be. Hi, my name is Nati. I'm from Nation Thailand. Two quick questions. The first one is, Myanmar has both political and economic problems. If you were the president, which one would be your main focus? And the second problem, uh, the, I mean, the second question would be, um, by the time of the next election, you would be 70, if I'm correct, and you are a national democracy icon. Have you ever thought about Myanmar without Aung San Suu Kyi? What would it be like? Thank you. Uh, to answer the first question, um, the, it, I do not think you can separate the two. You really cannot divorce political development from economic develop, development. In fact, there are those who say that economic growth and development are uh, a result of political change and not something that is separate. So I, would, I think these have to go in tandem and you have to find the right mix. Um, I've always, well, you know, Burma has existed very well without me in the past, and I'm sure it will go on existing well without me in the future when the time comes. We're almost running out of time. We'll take a few more questions. The one at the back. Uh, Hello, Dorsu. Kelly McNamara from AFP. Hello. Sorry, I'm hidden behind a couple of cameras. Hi. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, talking about youth unemployment, um, as you go into the um, election in 2015, what are you going to do to refresh your party? I mean, there's, there's often been a criticism that um, certainly the, uh, the, the higher echelons are, are, are dominated by, by a kind of old guard. Uh, are you looking to, to kind of regenerate the party in any way? We have a, a lot of younger people at the township level, at the village level, and even in our central committee. 
it's true that we do not have enough young people in the Central Executive Committee, and this is because we need to build up the capacity of our young people. I think I can say quite openly that uh, the younger people, the younger generations in Burma are less well-educated and than the older generation, and it's through no fault of their own. It's because of 50 years of a very bad education system. I am told that one survey found that Burma is one of the very, very few countries in the world where the young people are now are less well-educated than those 20 years ago. And certainly they are less well-educated than those 50 years ago when we had a very, very sound education system. So it is taking us some time to build up the capacity of our young people. But that's not the problem of the NLD alone. People talk as though it were the problem of the NLD alone. It's a national problem. We need to build up the capacity of our young people throughout the nation because of those years of a bad education system. One final question over there. Uh, Andy Minglawa, I'm Dan Sunye from 70 News. I'd just like to ask, under President Dawson Suu Kyi, what will the cabinet look like and whether your government will be uh, liberal, labor, or conservative? I would not like to talk about my government now when it has not even been decided that the, uh, the constitution will be amended to way, make way for me to go up to the presidency. But uh, I believe basically in liberal politics, which means that we are not dogmatic and that we do not think of our party as the most important element in politics. It's the people who should be the most important element in politics and it will be our, uh, the, the consideration of what is best for our people which would decide what kind of government we would try to shape. Thank you very much, Dr. Aung San Suu Kyi. It's an honor for us, all of us. Thank well, you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.